And so at this time, I'd like to introduce our banquet speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Fenn. Dr. Fenn received a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Duke University in 1981, and then attended Yale University, finishing her master's in 1985. She wrote a book for the University of North Carolina Press as part of the Way We Lived in North Carolina series, contributing part one, Natives and Newcomers. Fenn took a break from her doctoral program to study at Durham Technical Community College's auto mechanic program and worked as a mechanic around the Durham, North Carolina, Carolina area for eight years before returning to Yale in 1995 to complete her studies. Pax Americana, her dissertation about the 1775 to 1782 North American smallpox epidemic was written while working part-time and completed in 1999. That dissertation became the basis of her 2004 book, which won the 2004 Cox Book Prize. Her third book, Encounters at the Heart of the World, A History of the Mandan People, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2015. She also received the Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities in 2019. Dr. Fenn recently retired from the University of Colorado Boulder, where she is an Emerita Distinguished Professor in the Department of History. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Elizabeth Fenn. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Excellent. Give me one minute to change the slides. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it is such a treat to be here, to learn with you all, and to share my remarks this evening. I want to co convey special thanks to Christine Brown, wherever she is, for uh, inviting me and for pushing the bureaucratic wheels forward in order to make my visit possible. Now before I begin, I have a confession to make. I'm not Native American. I'm not from Montana. And I'm really not a Montana historian. I, I, I come to you from Colorado. Uh, I spent most of my life in North Carolina. And I grew up in New Jersey. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm a historian of early America, uh, of epidemic disease, and of the pre-1800 West. Uh, I'm not a man Montana specialist. Um, so I, I'm... <laughs> I'm really impressed by the energy of, of, the, of this place um, and, and of this, uh, this, this conference. Now, some indigenous traditions call for speakers to apologize. Uh, to apologize when addressing elders or others wiser than the speaker may be. Um, and honestly, I'm no spring chicken myself, but uh, I believe there are many elders in this audience and, uh, and Native peoples as well. Uh, and I'm humbled to speak before you. And I do speak you know, from, from a posture of humility as I address this, this history. So this is what we know. In 1805, a Native American woman living beside the Missouri River in, among North Dakota's Hidatsa people joined the famous Lewis and Clark 
expedition across the American West. Her infant son, Jean-Baptiste, accompanied her. And this woman's cultural and linguistic acumen, her geographic insight, her knowledge of indigenous foodways, all eased the expedition's transit. So too did her feminine presence. She appears rarely in the journals kept by the men of Thomas Jefferson's Corps of Discovery. But when she does appear, her presence is active and resourceful. You know, she, she thinks and acts quickly and effectively. In May of 1805, when a sudden gale dumps the co-captain's written record of their trip into the drink. She expresses joy and grief together upon encountering the Lemhi Shoshones, or Agaidakas, in August of 1805. And she is angry and determined in the winter of 1806 when the co-captains suggest that she should stay behind while others go to see a stupendous whale carcass that has washed up on the shores of the Pacific Ocean. Almost everything else about this woman's life is contested. Her tribal affiliation, her status as a captive, wife, or slave, her later years, her date of death, even her name. Was it Sacagawea, Sakakawea, Bird Woman, Sagbia, Poe Knife, Poribo, Grass Woman, Sakagawea, Wadzawipe, Janie, Minauda, or something else? Or did she perhaps go by more than one of those names? And the fact that most, if not all of you, are familiar with this woman is in itself a testament to her iconic status. Now, according to the National Geographic, it's not my usual source for information, but according to the National Geographic, there are reportedly more statues of Sacagawea than of any other American woman. Esquire magazine. Again, not the historian's usual source. Uh, but Esquire magazine listed her fifth among the 75 greatest women of all time. And in case you're wondering, the Greek poet Sappho, the Jewish queen Esther, uh, the French heroine Joan of Arc, and uh, the English Queen Elizabeth I all superseded her. But she came in fifth in that little competition. And, and indeed, many of us claim her as Americans, as Native Americans, as women, as expeditioners, as Westerners, as mothers, as forced or fortuitous travelers determined to make our own history. And that the facts of her life are contested should not be surprising, since so many people stake identities to her. And we, you know, we, have, we impose our own standards, expectations, uh, and projections, not just on her, but also on the sources that tell us about her. Some sources we value more than others. Some we valorize, some we forget, and some we ignore entirely. Scholars and amateurs alike have argued over major and minor aspects of this woman's life. They have praised her emergence as a good Indian, as an American heroine, uh, as an Indian princess alongside Pocahontas, and even as a suffragette in the making. And among them, two scholars, Virginia Scharf and Sally Macbeth, have truly seen Sacagawea for what she was, an indigenous woman whose contested life story has much to teach us about the initiative and mobility 
of Native women more generally. And what those scholars began, I hope to carry forward. Sacagawea, no matter how you pronounce her name, does indeed have much to teach us about the initiative and mobility of Native women. And in fact, she does this and more. Her life story, replete with controversy, has a great deal to teach us about the history of the West. So what I'm going to do this evening is take one version, one version of her story, covering a very brief period of her life, period lasting roughly a month in or around the year 1800. And I'm going to use it to illuminate a past that is only recently, only now, being incorporated into our historical canon. Now the gist of this story comes to us from two sources. The first source is an indigenous Mandan, or Nueta woman, named Earth Woman. Uh, Earth Woman was the daughter of a great Mandan chief named Matotope, or, or, or Forebears. Earth Woman grew up in North Dakota and married a fur trader named James Kipp, with whom I'm sure many of you are, are familiar. The second source is a white fur trader named Hugh Monroe, he was known among the Pekani Blackfeet as Rising Wolf. An Earth Woman and Hugh Monroe both claimed to have heard their, the story, or parts of it, from Sacagawea herself. Now, Earth Woman and Monroe, in turn, conveyed what they knew to a fur trader, explorer, historian named James Willard Schultz. Um, who wrote it down for posterity. And Schultz, incidentally, is, is more widely known for his accounts of life among uh, the Nitsitapi, um, uh, the Blackfoot people. So the shouts resounded from the valley downriver. The enemy, the enemy, the enemy was coming. A horse-born Shoshone warrior raised the alarm, his companions close on his heels. Just 60 miles south of us, in, this, in a Shoshone campsite at Three Forks, where the Jefferson, Gallatin, and Madison rivers come together to, to form the Missouri, pandemonium erupted. Women, children, and elders fled for their lives. Most ran upstream, hoping to jump on horses and to escape toward Lemhi Pass, where the terrain was familiar, where enemies were few, and where safety beckoned. Some, especially men, stopped and fought, fending off the attackers while the others ran. And some, caught out in the open, bolted for pockets of brush Pockets of brush that dot the scrublands um, where the Beaverhead Range meets the plains. A 10 year old Bowie Knife, or Grass Woman, had been playing with friends when these shrieks and cries burst forth. She ran for her people's campsite, desperate to find her mother, calling again and again to no avail. And then she fled. She fled away and upstream, tearing through brush as shouts and gunshots filled the air. I was a good runner, she recalled years later. And she put as many as three miles behind her. But eventually she tired, calling out desperately in one last party of her people as they passed. I cried out to them for help, for a horse, but they were so frightened they never looked toward me. On the far side of a waterway, we don't know which one, a stretch of trees promised cover. And grass woman raced along the riverbank and into the water, slipping and sliding over river rocks with four mounted enemies in pursuit. Horses' hooves splashed behind her, and 
then she remembered a rider suddenly seized my left arm and yanked me up on his horse in front of him. The Shoshone girl refused to give in. I whirled about and looked at him and tried to bite and scratch his face. And her captor laughed. With Poe Knife, also known as Grass Woman, in his grasp, he wheeled his horse and turned downstream. Now the attackers were Hidatsas, Native American farmers, hunters, and traders who lived 500 miles to the east in three fortified settlements along the upper Missouri River. Americans today know the plains and badlands of this region as the state of North Dakota. Now, according to Schultz's third-hand rendition of Grass Woman's first-hand account, the man who yanked her out of the water and onto his horse was a Hidatsa named Red Arrow roughly 50 years in age. Clasping the girl close, he and three other mounted warriors hastened their prisoner downriver to what had been the Shoshone campsite at Three Forks. Along the way, two horsemen joined them. And to grass woman's chagrin, they had two additional Shoshone girls in tow, and they passed two more of her playmates lying dead beside the trail. At the Three Forks campsite that had recently, so recently, been Grass Woman's home, the Hidatsas gathered all their captives together. There were nine in all. Four boys and five girls, all about my age, she recalled. And the detainees, the captives watched as a hundred or more Hidatsa men rummaged through their camp, taking what pleased them and setting fire to the lodges, hides, saddles, and everything that would burn. For the Hidatsas, the real prizes were captives and livestock. They collected a great band of Shoshone horses to carry away. <coughs> Excuse me. They even gave each prisoner a horse to ride. And with their camp in flames, and with Hidatsa warrior escorts all around, Grass Woman and her captive companions followed the Missouri River downstream, away from the mountainous high country that the Agaitacans or Lemhi Shoshone's called home. The events of that single day had transformed Poe Knife's circumstances forever. She lost more than her freedom. As her captors carried her away, she spotted her father scalped and lifeless beside the trail. Her mother died not long thereafter and a sister and a brother soon died as well. She never saw them again. Grass Woman even lost her name in the months and years that followed. But she also gained new names, including several, Sacagawea, Sakakawea, Sakagawea, widely known today. It's a phenomenal, emblematic of her stature in American history. Now, meanings and spellings and pronunciations may differ, much like claims about the life that she lived. But one thing is clear. This girl's story, with all of its twists and turns and uncertainties, provides a window onto a Western world in the throes of upheaval. So during the days and weeks that ensued, Grass Woman's Hidatsa captors carried their prisoners farther and farther from home. <laughs> After leaving the burning Shoshone camp, Grass Woman's captors rode north with their prisoners through the broad Missouri River Valley, keeping the Big Belt Mountains on their right and the Lewis Range on their left. And somewhere, 
probably right here near Helena. They stopped beside the river for the night. And I just ask that you contemplate this map, you know, this locality, this proximity, and the geographic immediacy of these events. It, it's, some, it's, like, it, it's a good moment just to pay homage to the, to the historical and continuing presence of indigenous peoples, Salish, Crow, Blackfeet, Bannock, Shoshone, and others, you know, right here on the very lands where we're gathered this evening. So at this first campsite, accounts tell of a bright moon and a visit from Red Arrow, who spoke to Grass Woman and to Otter Woman, a friend captured with her, in a kindly manner. Now, when tribes shared common linguistic traits, they could often communicate orally, despite minor differences, much as, say, Spanish and Italian speakers might understand one another. But Shoshones and Hidatsas had no such luck, since Shoshones speak uh, what's referred to as a Yuto Aztecan language, and Hidatsas speak a Suan language. And as a consequence, Red Arrow, Poe Knife, and Otter Woman spoke using the lingua franca of the plains, a highly effective gesture system called Plains Sign Language. The Hidatsa man sat near us, Grass Woman reported, and said in signs, you two are mine. Do not be afraid of me, but do not try to escape. Now, of course, she and the other captives were terrified, and they thought constantly of escape, despite his warning. They were also exhausted. So after midnight, that first night, they fell asleep. Three more days on horseback brought the entourage to a campsite just above the Great Falls of the Missouri, where this stepped series of cascades once plummeted more than 500 feet over a 10 mile stretch of the river. Um, and as you know, most of these cascades lie beneath the waters of artificial lakes today. Uh, these falls, incidentally, represent the varied durability of ancient bedrock. Um, soft mud and siltstone succumbing readily to riverine erosion where harder sandstone um, resists the same effects. Before a decade passed, William Clark, one of the two co-captains of Thomas Jefferson's Corps of Discovery, would proclaim these falls to be one of the grandest views in nature, more spectacular than anything I ever saw. Um, now, for Shoshone captives, fear trumped awe. Great Falls were a landmark. That was as far as we had ever come out upon the plains with our people, Grass Woman recalled, describing the eastern limits of Shoshone mobility at the time. So the country they now entered was foreign to them. And I should, I, I, let, me, let me back up a second. It's the eastern limits of Shoshone mobility for women and children. Shoshone men, and warriors, and hunting parties uh, ventured much, much further across the plains. But it was as far as women and children typically ventured. Now, from Great Falls, the party traveled northeast from the Missouri River into a landscape of space and grass. Accustomed as we were to a mountain country, the plains terrified us, Bowie Knife said. The sheer expanse boggled the mind. It extended, in her words, to the edge of the world. Now, if this strange landscape was fearsome, so too were its implications. Escape seemed less and less feasible. We saw that without horses or the means of carrying water, we should die from thirst before we could ever get home again, she said. Now, if our account of it is correct, the route that the Hidatsas took in departing Great Falls is an unlikely one. 
It angled northeast across the plains toward the modern Saskatchewan border, staying west of the Bears Paw Mountains and following the approximate route of US Highway 87 today. They were on the outskirts of Blackfeet country. Blackfeet and Hidatsas typically clash. I don't, so I don't have an explanation for this, but uh, you know, perhaps the Hidatsas, uh, flesh with success, sought more horses or captives. Or perhaps there's some other reason, uh, a search for bison or eagles, or an avoidance of unknown obstacles, something else that drew them northeast instead of along that more direct easterly route that followed the Missouri River. Three days of, rate of riding brought the party to the Milk River. It was but a small stream, Grass Woman recalled, but it held the promise of escape. Now, as you all know, for travelers in a parched prairie landscape, thirst is a serious obstacle, all the more so for a runaway on foot. The river solved that. Equally important, the Shoshone youth reckoned that it probably flowed from the mountains. It might somehow lead them back west toward their Agaidaka homeland, toward their people and their families. So talking among themselves, after they reached the Milk River, they resolved to flee that very night. The day went on. And enthusiasm flagged as it unfolded and as other realities settled in. The Shoshone saw huge herds of animals in the Milk River Valley. The meat on the hoof astonished the eager escapees. The plains teemed with buffalo and antelope, grass woman said, using the, the common label for, for pronghorns. Pockets of timber concealed elk white tails and mule deer. This abundance might have seemed promising, but it came with a drawback. Huge, amply fed grizzly bears seemed to be everywhere. More numerous and reportedly much bigger than those in Agaidaka country, the animals were terrifying. We should never reach our mountains, one Shoshone girl said. The big bears would kill us all. Others worried that, if, that, that escape might mean starvation. They had no weapons to hunt the wildlife that flourished around them. And the area seemed destitute of edible tubers and ripened berries. So disheartened, the captives resolved not to flee that night and instead to watch and wait for a time when they could seize weapons and make a run for it. For five days, they rode east through the Milk River Valley. Late on the fifth day, they reached the Missouri again. The Missouri River's waters were easy to recognize. Um, they knew this river and uh, it, it sent a, a wave of optimism rippling through Grass Woman and her companions. This is a waterway they knew. Like, unlike the, the milk with its unknown headwaters, the Missouri was familiar. They knew it led home. So the time had come to hatch a plan. And they implemented it that very night. Grass Woman watched and waited as Hidatsa campfires blazed. And then, as they faded to coals, a Shoshone boy named Elkhorn quietly crawled to the side of a Hidatsa warrior and took the sleeping man's quiver and bow. And now, Poe Knife went into action, nudging her companions into wakefulness. Four boys and two girls slipped down the riverbank and into the Missouri River, hanging fast to a driftwood log for flotation. But one girl, Leaping Fish Woman, fell back to sleep after Grass Woman 
roused her. And another otter woman would not wake at all. If you have teenagers, you might be familiar with this. So it's so a grass woman covered otter woman's mouth and tried to shake her into alertness. Awake, come, we must go, she whispered, to no avail. And in desperation, she took the sleeping girl's hands and yanked her out of her slumber. And otter woman's surprised cry roused the Hidatsas as well. And they surrounded the sleepy, slow-moving girls and rushed in all directions seeking the missing. But the missing were safe, launched homeward into the night. So now the captives, once nine, numbered three. Grass woman, leaping fish woman, and otter woman. Day after day, we continued down the valley of the big river, grass woman remembered. They traversed flat, grassy bottomlands and great groves of cottonwoods. They saw hordes of game, animals so unaccustomed to a human presence that they took little note when the party passed by. And at night, the travelers feasted on bison cows killed at will by Hidatsa hunters. And eventually, the time in transit is unclear. It was probably 10 to 12 more days. They reached their destination. Five busy villages, three Hidatsa and two Mandan that sat near the confluence of the Knife and Missouri rivers. And here, among strangers, the Agaidaka girls took on a new life. Leaping fish woman escaped in the months that followed. But grass woman and otter woman found themselves attached first to Red Arrow, and then to a French-Canadian fur trader named Toussaint Charbonneau, uh, who lived among the Hidatsas. And whether we should call them wives or slaves or captives seems open to discussion. So what does this story, encompassing roughly four weeks of grass woman's life, what does this reveal about the early West? Well, let's, let's start at Three Forks, where the Hidatsa War Party found the Agaidaka Shoshones camped for their summer bison hunt. The Agaidakas had known the peril at hand, the peril of venturing on to the plains for the hunt. And for most of the year, they lived to the west, amid the peaks and gorges of the Bitterroots, the Lemhi Range, the Salmon River Mountains. You know, those names sound familiar to, to most Americans, um, but as residents or scholars of this area, you all know that the landscape itself remains some of the least hospitable terrain in the lower 48 states. And this is all the more true in grass woman's time. But for the Agaidaka Shoshones, the terrain that seems so daunting to others was a refuge. It was a, a protective fortress into which enemies dared not tread. So in this area west of Lemhi Pass, Agaidakas lived in safety for much of the year. Most of the year, hunting for mountain sheep, digging for camas roots, uh, collecting pine nuts, fishing for salmon. Once a year, however, usually in late summer, the Agaidakas banded together for safety and ventured eastward, down and out of the mountains and onto the plains for communal bison hunts. Yet yeah, there was no comparable resource when it came to hides, meat, and fat. But with that bison bounty came danger. Other peoples, Blackfeet, Assiniboines, Crees, Mandans, Hidatsas, maybe even you know, Kiowas, Arapahos, and Cheyennes. Other peoples seemed hell-bent on attacking Shoshones, harassing them, stealing their horses, taking women and children into captivity. And it had not always been this way. 
just 70 years earlier, Shoshonean peoples, Shoshonean peoples who were many and varied, had been ascendant. Because of trade ties to their Numuna or Comanche kinfolk to the south, Shoshones were among the first northern nations to acquire horses in large numbers. And by the 1730s, energized and on horseback, Shoshones of all stripes had burst out of the mountains and onto the plains, causing other tribes to retreat under their onslaught. In the north, one of the retreating tribes was the Blackfeet. And we know some of this story thanks to the account of a man named Sokamapi. Sokamapi was actually, he was a, a native Cree man. He was born around 1710. Uh, but he lived among the Pekani Blackfeet for most of his life. And he reported that traditionally, before the horse, Shoshones and Pekani Blackfeet had clashed on foot in the pedestrian era. And they had faced off in long lines of as many as 350 shield-bearing warriors armed with bows and arrows and according to rock art evidence, war clubs as well. Now, unless one side seriously outnumbered the other, these encounters often ended in a draw with little damage done. And I should say that the, the shields you see here and the shields I'm describing here in the pedestrian era are full body shields. These are enormous shields. Um, and I believe, I don't know if Nina Sanders is still here, but uh, the, sh the shields she showed us in our plenary session, uh, session at lunch were smaller shields probably from the, the, the equestrian era. These are full body shields, which is why the rock art images look like all shield with, with feet and with heads. In the 1730s, however, this warfare changed. War between Blackfeet and Shoshones changed. Shoshones, so Kamapi said, had acquired, by this time, horses. They called them Mr. Tim big dogs or horses on which they rode swift as the deer and from which they dashed at the Blackfeet with their stone pukamogan or war clubs. This was, this, was a, this was a terrifying form of attack as equestrian Shoshones, war clubs whirling, bore down on pedestrian neighbors and expanded their territory, territory dramatically. That expansion lasted a generation or so. And then Sokomapi described a later battle, undated, that signaled yet another new turn of affairs. And in this later encounter, the Peak and the Blackfeet and their Assiniboine allies had a brand new advantage of their own. Firearms, guns, 10 in all, all acquired long distance from Hudson Bay or Northwest Company traders. And the result, this battle was a stunning victory for the Blackfeet. It must have shocked the Shoshones. Some 50 of their number reportedly lay dead. And just to be clear, the image here, this is anachronistic, okay? Uh, the, this is a much later battle. It's a, a petroglyphite writing on stone up in Alberta. Um, but it does portray on the, on the left side, you'll see uh, uh, firearms. With the, you could see the ball, the trajectory of the ball leaving the muzzle. And if you look really closely, it's really hard to see these, some of these images. Um, you see horses on, on the right. So it represents that clash between you know, equestrian warriors and uh, other warriors with, with firearms, but this is much, much later. So Shoshone bands, at least those in the north like the Agaitikas, had no access to firearms. 
which Blackfeet and Assiniboines and Crees and Crows and Mandans and Hidatsas soon acquired in abundance. And these well-armed people, including the Blackfeet, soon acquired their own horses too. Before long, Shoshones were on the run. Sokamapi describes Pekani Blackfeet advancing and the Shoshones incrementally retreating back toward the mountains. You know, the, the Snake or Shoshone Indians are no match for us, Sokamapi said in the winter of 1787 and 88. They have no guns. They are no match for us. So let's return to the experience of Poe Knife or Grass Woman. Buffeted by the Blackfeet and others, her Agaitika Shoshone band had hunkered down behind the formidable height of Lemhi Pass. But the lure of bison to the east was irresistible. By 1800, when Shoshones launched bison hunts, they typically did so in large numbers. They combined two or more bands for safety. If that was the case for grass woman's people, it didn't help. Right? They came under attack by Hidatsas amply supplied with firearms, which were still impossible to obtain for the Agaidicas. Now the Agaidicas may not have had guns, but they still had those horses. They had horses in abundance thanks to their Comanche trade ties. And those horses, along with captives, were the prizes sought by Hidatsa war parties. Now in the aftermath of the Three Forks Battle, Grass Woman's forced trek eastward was also a testament to historical change. Note that it was horses that transported the Shoshone girl and her companions through strange territories and those terrifying open spaces. And in fact, the area through which they traveled appears to have frightened most of those who entered it. Sokamapi, the Cree man who lived with the Pekani Blackfeet, explained that even though the Blackfeet had pushed the Agaitikas and other northern Shoshones back into the mountains, Shoshone warriors remained threatening. Yeah, they still had they saw the power to vex, to harass the Blackfeet, and to, to make Blackfeet afraid uh, for, for small hunting parties. So from the Yellowstone Conference west, confluence westward, the upper Missouri region was really a kind of a sprawling battlefield. Shoshone war parties swept down from the mountains to attack Blackfeet, Hidatsas, Mandans, Assiniborns, maybe even Arapahoes and Cheyennes at, at certain times. And those same peoples launched raids of their own, sometimes against each other and often against Shoshones, when parties like Grass Woman's ventured eastward to hunt. This was a dangerous place to be if you were human. For large mammals, this was paradise. It was what ecologists sometimes call a buffer zone, a space between major predator populations that allows animals to flourish. And in this case, it was not just a buffer zone, but a special kind of a, a subspecies of buffer zone, if you will, that uh, one set of ecologists has labeled a war zone. The, the, the classic example that we're all, all familiar with today is the demilitarized zone separating North and South Korea. Um, it's an area where humans dare not enter, but wildlife, including endangered species, can flourish. During her transit, Grass Woman bore witness to the stunning abundance of wildlife on the lands adjoining the Milk and Upper Missouri Rivers above the Yellowstone in this buffer zone or war zone through which they traveled. You know, the bison, the elk, the mule deer, the pronghorns, the daunting grizzlies of the Milk River Valley proliferated at least in part because humans should not. 
The threat of violence made human habitation too risky. Grass Woman's journey also tied her to a deeper Plains history. As some of you know, I hope, a mere 10 miles from the Agaidica's Three Forks campsite, an impressive monument to earlier bison hunters towers over the Madison River. Known today as the Madison Buffalo Jump, this rock sentinel still beckons to those who pass by. Visit it if you haven't. Ignore the rattlesnake summons. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a, a bison jump, for those unfamiliar with the term, is a place where humans drove herds of animals over a precipice, creating both bounty and carnage on the hillsides below. An assessment of this hunting technique by the archaeologist Jack Brink sums up its effectiveness as follows. Now, this, this, listen, I want you to listen to this because it blows my mind. Okay, This is Jack Brink speaking. If a herd of 100 bison were run off of a cliff at a single event, a number considered average, there is nothing in the four million years of human evolution when a comparable amount of food was procured at one time. This, this was, as Jack Brink says, the most productive food-getting enterprise ever devised by human beings. Now, a diverse array of peoples probably frequented the Madison Jump, but experts believe the main users were Shoshones. And it's no stretch to say that these were probably grass woman's direct ancestors. But the Jump apparently fell into disuse. Around 1750, a half a century before her abduction, so allow me to elaborate. Four days after her capture, assuming the Schultz account is correct, Grass Woman, her Shoshone companions, and their Hidatsa assailants camped beside the Missouri above Great Falls. Another bison jump, known as Um Pishkin, I believe there's a typo, it's, I've got an N instead of an M. Uh, uh, known as Um Pishkin, is recently renamed First People's Buffalo Jump. Another Another bison jump was a stone's throw away from this campsite. It too had fallen into disuse. But members of the party would have passed it as they headed across the plains toward the Milk River. And that word pishkin, if you're not familiar with it, um, means deep kettle of blood in the language of the Blackfeet. Three days later, the party approached the Milk River at a place called Wakpachugan. Wakpachugan is an Assiniboine name, meaning Little River. Here, however, it's used to designate yet another bison jump, where early Americans once harvested meat by the ton. And the bone beds of these jumps are just, are absolutely fabulous. I mean, they're 30, 20, 30, 40 feet deep. Um, the Wakpachugan Jump survives today. You should go visit it. Um, it's behind the uh, Holiday Village shopping mall <laughs> in the town of, of Howard. Um, it's really it's a wonderful historic site. They've got hat ladles kids can throw. Yeah, um, it's definitely worth visiting. And, and the bone beds, <laughs> the bone beds are visible and give you a sense of the effectiveness of this hunting technique. But in terms of a use by native peoples, what could you do like the other jumps? It too had been abandoned by the time grass woman passed by. So why, given the nourishment they provided, why were these fabulous jumps no longer in use? Well, one, uh, one answer is uh, maybe location. Um, all these jumps are in or near the upper Missouri war zone that was so hazardous to humans who entered it. 
Um, and as, as grass movements capture suggests, hunting here was, was fruitful, but it was also dangerous. But there's another answer as well. With horses increasingly available, after the mid-1700s, plains peoples began to prefer mounted surrounds to jumps when it came to harvesting bison. So in a surround, mounted hunters raced around a bison herd at breakneck speed, keeping the animals contained and disoriented while peppering them with volleys of arrows fired at close range. Uh, and, and you, you know, Plains peoples preferred uh, lances and bows and arrows for the, uh, over guns for these hunts um, until the latter part of the 19th century when breech-loading rifles became widely available. As you can imagine, muzzle loaders were a nightmare on a horse. <laughs> now, from Wak Pechugan, the Hidatsas and their dejected captives followed the Milk River to its confluence with the Missouri, where all the prisoners, except for Grass Woman, Otter Woman, and Leaping Fish Woman, made their waterborne escape. The three girls continued east with their escorts through the Missouri River Valley. And here we know nothing precise about their route. I probably should have rendered that portion of their route in dashed, uh, dashed line on, on the map. Um, needless to say, it seems possible, even likely, that they followed the eastern portion of the warpath that appears on a map given to William Clark by a native headman named Sheheke also called Big White or White Coyote. This was given to William Clark by Sheheke in 1805. Sheheke was a Mandan, and Mandans were close allies and neighbors of Hidatsas. The chief gave me a sketch of the country as far as the high mountains. It shows how much William, uh, Lewis and Clark relied on indigenous geographic knowledge. He gave me a sketch of the country as far as the high mountains, William Clark noted on January 7th, 1805. And he then rendered Sheheke's information on maps of his own. And the war path, as you can see, heads, as Clark labeled it, nearly east. So if you're traveling eastward, he crosses the Yellowstone and the Little Missouri and then follows the less well-known Knife River to the Hidatsa and Mandan settlements. If this is indeed a rough rendition of Grass Woman's course, she may well have caught a glimpse of Plains history that puts bison jumps, even bison jumps, into perspective. The bison jumps I've talked about today had seen use for 2,000 years or fewer, but Wak Pachugan probably lo longer. Um, they'd seen use for about 2,000 years. But the warpath beside the Knife River traversed a resource field mined for 10,000 years or more. For miles along this aptly named Knife River, the landscape is pockmarked with flint quarries, tapped not just by comparative newcomers like Hidatsas, Mandans, and Shoshones like Grash Woman, but also by ancient Paleo-Indians and Clovis people, Folsom people, other pedestrian visitors over millennia. Knife River Flint is one of the primary surviving trade items of the Northern Plains. Archaeologists have found it in Saskatchewan, in Nebraska, Missouri, Texas, Wisconsin, uh, Tennessee, even Pennsylvania. And even in Grass Woman's day, as arrow points of iron and steel became common, this flint continued in circulation. She and her companions may have paused here to dig. They may have carried lithic material with them to artisans and to trading visitors at their destination. The Hidatsa villages at the mouth of the Knife River. So as the crow flies, Grass Woman and her companions co covered roughly 500 miles 
although in actual distance they traveled much further. Their transit, however, marks more than distance covered. It marks a convergence of historical processes at a particular moment in time. The story of Brass Woman, also known as Poenaim, also known as Sacagawea, Sacagawea, allows us to personalize these processes in ways that I hope make the deep history of the early West accessible and engaging. So our journey this evening, hundreds of miles and three to four weeks in length, brought the Shoshone prisoners to a site that they found astonishing and perplexing. A village of domed, grass-covered earth lodges, surrounded in its entirely by an imposing palisade of wooden stakes embedded into the ground. How we three girls did stare at it, Poe Knife exclaimed. They had arrived at the home of the Awatiha Hidadzas, one of five Hidadza and Mandan settlements at the confluence of the Knife and Missouri rivers. From here, Sikagawi's experience would shed still more light on the tangled history of the American West. Thank you. Oh.